Come on, we are, we're moving forward. This is a season of advancement. The church is not retreating. I'll tell you, the prophetic movement is not retreating. Stay out of the crazy controversies. The prophetic movement is alive and well and moving forward and advancing. Come on. We are not going to be deterred from the things that God's called us to. But we are going to answer the call of the watchman. Jesus called us to watch and pray. Let's put up Isaiah 62, 6. Answer the call as a watchman. It says, I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord. How many of you call on the Lord? Let me just say, we should be watchmen over our own homes. We should be watchmen over our own communities. You guys are out there in the community. You need to be watching what's happening in our community. What is it that we need to be confronting and praying about? We need to be watching for our nation. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. He's saying, don't get passive. And give, him, and give him no rest. He's saying, harass the Lord. <laughs> give God no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. You know what's giving? It, it actually says that this in uh, the, the New King James, it says, you who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourself. You who remind the Lord. Come on, we need to remind the Lord daily. America shall be saved. Come on, we need to let that be our decree daily. America shall be saved. Say it with me. America shall be saved. As watchmen, we need to be watching from that positioning to say, God, show us how to pray. God, show us what to prophesy. God, show us what to decree because America shall be saved. My family shall be saved. My children shall be saved. My grandchildren shall be saved. Harass the Lord with it. Is that an okay word, God? Yeah, he says, yeah. <laughs> Constantly remind him what he promised. Now, this, this verse isn't up on, the, on the, the screen. If you'll put the next screen up, Simon. But I want to just tell you this, this, one, um, this one verse. Uh, this is what Jesus told us to watch and pray. Daniel 4.17 is a very interesting scripture. And it says, the decision, this is during the days of Nebuchadnezzar. It says, the decision is by the decree of the watcher. The decision is by the decree of the watcher. Now, in the days of Daniel, the watchers were the angels, okay? But that word watcher actually means um, those that are set to protect, those that are watchful ones, those that are awake. You see, in the Old Testament and, and, in, and in the medieval times, the watchmen as you saw in that one picture, were stationed on a watchtower. And they were, the watchmen were primarily stationed two different places. And I think that both of these places are important for us today. One was they were stationed on the walls of the city. We need to be watching for our individual cities. Those of you that are watching online, you need to watch for your individual city. Those of you that are from this area, we need to watch for our city. Okay? And we need to know how to pray. Watching for our city, watching for our nation. The second place that they stationed watchmen was on the hilltops. And what were, the hill, what were they doing on the hilltops? They were watching over the harvest. Okay? Because if you remember, back in the days of Gideon, the Amalekites would sweep in whenever the harvest was ripe. And they would, they would basically ransack the harvest and take all the harvest for themselves. So they would station watchmen. And what did the watchmen do? The watchmen didn't just watch. The watchmen sounded an alarm. And when they sounded the alarm, the... Uh, the, the rest of the military was mobilized. We need to understand, if we're drafting you all into the watchman army, we need to all understand that there's going to be times that an alarm gets sounded and that we need to hit our knees, that we need to begin to pray in the spirit, that we need to, uh, to, that we need to engage at a moment's notice, no matter where you are. The beautiful thing about mask wearing on your job is that nobody can tell that you're speaking in tongues. Right? And so what we have to understand is that this is a, a season of watchfulness and a season of readiness. Thank you. I guess I did do, do that scripture. It says, and the sentence is by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. And so we have to understand this is our calling. This is what we're called to. We're called to watch. We're called to pray. 
We're called to engage. We're called to fight. And we're called, in this place of prayer, we have to understand that prayer is powerful. Do we actually believe that when we pray, things change? And people say, you know, we prayed for our nation. We prayed really, really hard. Yes, we did. God's up to something. I don't have an explanation for you. All I can tell you is God's up to something. But I can tell you that our prayers were not for nothing. I can tell you that, all right? I, I, I want to introduce you to a man named Hudson Taylor. And Hudson Taylor was a British missionary that went to China, and he founded the China Inland Mission. And this is what he said. I think it's such a beautiful challenge. He said, the prayer power has never been tried to its full capacity. If we want to see mighty wonders of divine power and grace wrought in the place of weakness, failure, and disappointment, then let us answer God's standing challenge. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show you great and mighty things which you knowest not. This man believed in the power of prayer to shape a nation. His prayer life enabled him to penetrate a hostile nation, the nation of China, with the gospel. At the end of his life, he left 800 missionaries in China and over 125,000 Christians in China. And he became known as the father of the modern, or uh, the father of the mission movement, inspired missionaries all over the world. And we need to understand that whether you're a missionary to China or whether you're a missionary to Santa Rosa Beach, we all have a job. To watch and pray and penetrate. Amen. I want to read you the story of a, a place called Miseram. Miseram, this, came, this comes out of a uh, uh, Christ for the Nations magazine. Uh, we're Christ for the Nations graduates. And um, this was written by Sister Lindsay back when she was alive. Um, and uh, she talked about Miseram. Now, Miseram is also known as Nagaland. Okay, so for some of you that are listening or watching, probably Americans, we don't know either one of them, do we? Okay, so... She starts out and she says, where is Miseram? Most Americans wouldn't have the foggiest notion. It's wedged between a Muslim nation, uh, Pakistan, a Buddhist country, Myanmar, and a Hindu state, Assam. But Miseram is different. It is Christian. Of its 700,000 population, 500,000 Mizos are born again. And of the 200,000 non-Mizos, 60% have converted to Christ or were Christians when they arrived. And of the rest, the Lord adds those who are being saved to the church daily, as in Acts 2.47. Today, Miseram can boast there are no homeless, no starvation, no beggars, and nearly 100% literacy. How and when did all this begin in a nation that in only three generations has been transformed from a nation of headhunters and cannibals to a nation of soul winners. <laughs> kind of a hard case, right? Headhunters and, and, and cannibals. It started in January 1894 when two Welsh missionaries arrived in Miseram, the first step in that nation becoming the most Christian community on earth. Today, over 80% of the entire population attend church at least once a week. I'm just going to let that sink in for just a minute. <laughs> Every Miso church has prayer daily. Let that sink in for a minute. Many starting at 5 a.m. Let's just skip right over that part, okay? <laughs> Those unable to care for themselves are assigned to 10 families who adopt them. This includes those who need physical or material assistance. The 10 families work together to make sure the needy are properly fed, clothed, and housed. Those first missionaries taught that every church should be self-supporting, and it's working. Miseram, which has only one-tenth of one percent of India's population, has sent out well over 1,000 full-time missionaries, a, a number of them to India as well as to other neighboring nations. Listen to this. Their divorce rate is a fraction of one percent. Teen pregnancy is rare, prostitution is unheard of, AIDS is a disease that happens elsewhere. The Mizos love to sing, worship, and dance before the Lord. Their choirs are now traveling all over the world. If God could transform Miseram and answer to fervent prayer, just think what he can do in America today. <laughs> 